So it happened coming out of the car wash. Daisy was in the middle row. Lennox was in the back seat, buckled into his car seat, which is always a process with a three-year-old. Uh, first, there's the season where every time you have to buckle him in. Then there's the season where he wants to buckle himself in, which is the season we're currently in. Here's a little fun fact. He's not very good at it or fast at it or thorough about it. So that's aggravating. But we'll, he will cry if, if we go back and do it. I can do it myself. And so there's always the waiting. And there's always the triple confirmation. Did Lennox finish buckling everything up? Is it done properly? I mean, I'm talking, is it at his sternum? Is it tight enough? Or, and he's like, oh, no, it's perfectly tight. It's like you could fit nine of them in there. That's not going to work. And so we successfully got the confirmation from Daisy, who is 10, and a details person. So Daisy says, no, Dad, he is buckled in. And so we come out of the car wash, because during the car wash, everybody's unbuckled. It's a circus in our car. Everyone's looking up this you know, sunroof and watching the octopus attack the car. And there's tears sometimes. You, it's just there's lots of lot, all the things, guys. And so uh, coming out of the car wash, turning left, spot the opening. And so I gun it. We take the left turn. And Dad says, uh, Daisy says, Dad, Dad, uh, Dad. And I say, what? She goes, Lennox. I go, what? Did he, did he unbuckle? She goes, no, he tipped over. At which point I said, he did what? So I quickly pull over onto the side of the road and look back. And sure enough, Lennox is tipped over. He is in his car seat. I will let you know, buckled in perfectly to his car seat. The problem was his car seat was not buckled into the car. And so this was the first epiphany. Lennox knows how to, uh, to unbuckle his car seat, which is almost like the velociraptors learning how to get out of the cages a little bit, because now it's a new thing we have to confirm. Is he buckled in? Is the car seat buckled in? And so the, the, the second epiphany, which I still don't know the answer to, I'll have to get to heaven and pull up the DVR, is how many days has it been since that car seat was unbuckled and no one had just done a quick left turn? And so we sort this out and had the conversation and the learning opportunity. And as we continued heading down the road, that's when God began to speak to me. What are the areas of my life that look like they're put together, but that deep down there's not that base, there's not that foundation, there's not that root system? And this is what is to be on our minds as we continue now week two of our series of messages called Take Back Your Life a 40-day adventure and journey, interactive, that is all about us learning how to think right so that we can live right, and trying to root out uh, dysfunction, areas of our lives that are not healthy, are not productive, relationships, habits, ways of thinking that are toxic. And we're not just going for the surface stuff, because I think it's pretty easy in this life that's always go, 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 got to gotta be there, got to do this, got to gotta get that done, to, to have the quick check and say, I'm buckled in, I'm good. But the question we're asking in this series is, is the thing you're buckled into buckled in? Because you can look good on the surface, but still deep down not have that anchor, not have that foundation, not be scalable long term. We don't want to just have a good year or even a good decade. We want to we want to last. We want to build lives out of marble. We want eternal impact. We want Jesus to, to tell us, well done, good and faithful servant when we stand before him. So that's what we're really trying to do as we take our lives back. We're trying to take back the control from things we've given it to that are not long term going to make us happy. And as we continue in the second week of this series, I'll remind you that we said last week, this is all about testing. We're all about this 40-day period that in the Bible, again and again, comes down to this idea of testing. And we're, we're being tested. I don't think it's any mistake that if you take 20 and add it to 20, what you're going to get to is 40. And we're in this 2020 time of testing where just about everything uh, that can be tested is being tested. These, as they say, are the times that try men's souls. And so we're trying to come to a place where we're passing this test. The Bible says that God doesn't test us to destroy us. He tests us to prove the work that he's capable of doing deep down inside of our hearts. And if you, if you have a Bible right there where you are, would you uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6? And I want to give to you a message that I'm calling Sight for Sore Eyes. Sight for Sore Eyes. And this would be a perfect time 
to hit that share button on Facebook or to send the YouTube link to a friend, to someone in your life who needs to be encouraged uh, from God's word. Whether you're watching this live or you're watching it down the road later on, just think about anybody in your life you could be used uh, to encourage, to give them a lift. Hey, I'm, I'm going through this book with my church. It's a 40-day devotional. I thought you'd listen to this message. Maybe you'd like it. Maybe you'd want to get the book. Maybe you wouldn't. I, I gave it to a friend this week, someone I know, and, and he was really touched. He said, thank you so much. That, that really means a lot. I'm going to set it down next to my Bible and, and read it. And I just, I, I love that. I love that I can check in with him now in a couple days and have an easy frame of reference because we're going to go in through the same thing. And it's pretty neat and pretty special. When I say sight for sore eyes, of course, I'm conjuring up those images of someone you haven't seen in a while. And uh, now you're, you're in front of them again. And just that feeling of refreshment. A friend of mine who I follow on Instagram, and we've, we've been together you know, uh, here and there in life, but I, I follow his. It's funny on Instagram, we like know what each other are doing, even when we're not around each other. So like when we do you know, get to be around each other, we're like, oh, how's that thing going that I don't know about firsthand, but I did see you post about it last February. Uh, it's really easy to stalk people. So I, I just saw that he was with his grandparents, but not with them in person. He was with them through a window because he wanted to be there with them, but couldn't be there next to them. And, and so just that touching, like, I'm, I'm close, but not right there. And, and, and how sweet it will be when we can finally just hug without caring again and, and be around one another. I think there will be a lot of sight for sore eyes type of comments we'll be able to make about loved ones we haven't seen because of proximity or the difficulty of travel or the fear of, of spreading a disease. And, and so that's what we're talking about, sight for, for sore eyes. The, the idea of lenses comes up again and again and again in this book because there is such an import on what we see, on the things that we say, on how we respond to the things that we feel. And Jesus speaks directly to this topic in Matthew chapter 6. This is a very famous passage. It's the Sermon on the Mount, which is so named because he gave this sermon while well, standing on a mount, as you could expect. Verse 22, Matthew 6, this is God's word. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And Jesus, I, I pray that as we pause our lives that can be so crazy just to listen to you, to hear from heaven, to be refreshed, not just through singing worship songs to you, but now as we listen to words written by you, by your spirit. This is your word on this page, eternal, able to help, able to heal. And we ask that you would give us eyes to see what, what you want us to, and power to change. And I, I, I pray for salvation. I pray for progress in the journey of sanctification and becoming more like you. I pray for people discouraged today. You would encourage them. And I pray that we would be inspired to live a better story. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a while back that I landed in Texas. I was on a little preaching trip. And I uh, was picked up at the airport along with someone from our team who was traveling with me. And uh, we were taken to eat. A meal. There was a meal being put on by the people who had brought us in to, to give a talk at this church in Dallas. And, and while we were in the restaurant, the person who was driving us around, he did a little shopping. At least that's what I noticed, because when I got back into the car behind me, in the, not that I was like snooping, but there was a, a bag that hadn't been there before. Urban Outfitters is what it said. And I just thought to myself, apparently he was capitalizing on his time to do a little shopping. And uh, so we got to the church, and I, I had to change pretty quickly. The event happened. And while we were kind of in the back room, sort of going over the program for the conference, talking about different flow things, who's going to speak when, and who's introducing who, and what band is doing what, and, and all this was kind of going on, I noticed that our host, who had been taking care of our details, getting us around, slipped into the bathroom and came out just before the pre-service prayer. And when he came out, he was wearing a different shirt. He had been wearing like a black t-shirt. 
And when he came out, he was wearing like a, a Hawaiian style shirt, buttoned up, collared. Uh, only this one had uh, a print all over it. It was kind of squiggles, but the squiggles uh, sort of like were this abstract design repeated over and over and over again. Now, I, I, I shouldn't have been fixated on his shirt because I had to give a message to like 5,000 people in just a few moments. But I'm, I'm thinking like, apparently this was the shirt. He, maybe this was the shirt he bought earlier. I don't, I don't know. It's, I'm like, OK, I see what's happening here. He's like, got this shirt. He's like, this is, this is the night. This is the night, this shirt, we'll see the light of day. And, and so now we're huddled up, and the band's over here, and, and, and we're over there. And, and, and I, as, I, as I recall, it was Carrie Job about to lead worship. And so she's kind of you know, giving like this amazing like, little prophetic word in the pre-service prayer. And, and this pastor's over here. And, uh, and just before uh, the prayer began, I looked one more time at the shirt. And I, 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 am, I, am I seeing things, or do those little squiggly lines actually those are naked women. That's what I thought to myself. Those squiggly lines aren't just squiggly lines. Those are naked women. OK, now the prayer has begun. We are linked up in hands, hand in hand. We are, we are beseeching the throne room of Almighty God for mercy and help in time of need. For the, the pastor dropped to his knees at one point, And I, I can't stop staring at the shirt. I'm like, is it really that? Then I start to go, no, it's not that. I, this, is, this probably says more about me than the shirt. It's like probably one of those psychological tests. You know, it's probably just nothing, or, or you, well, you see what you want to see. So I'm like, no, then I don't want to see that. So I'm, I'm like, no. And then just, I mean, just to be sure, I peek out of the corner of my eyes. It's my turn to pray now. I'm like, those are naked people. And so I'm just like, it was like, it was, I, I did, I totally fumbled the prayer. Now we're getting escorted out to the front row. Service has begun. Uh, there's thousands of people in a room. Use your imagination. Uh, we, are, we are singing, and it's worship, and it's powerful. The spirit is moving. And I look over, and my host has both hands in the air. I think I saw a tear trickling down his cheek, just naked. No, then I'm like, you know what? How can I judge the guy? He is praising God. Maybe, maybe they're more, you know, just free in Texas, you know. Maybe this is just celebrating the beauty of creation. And so if he's worshiping, I'm like, who am I to judge? But that's pretty weird. Those are naked women on his shirt in the house of the Lord, right? And so I just now, but now I'm like, I have two songs till I have to preach. I need to actually, like, what message am I even giving? So I'm, like, opening my Bible, and, and, and I'm trying to figure things out. And just before the video was going to play that would introduce me to go on stage, I look over, and my host has a windbreaker zipped up to his chin. Just tight. It's not even, it doesn't fit him. I don't think it's his. It was somebody else's. And I look over, and I go, are, are were you cold? And he goes, there's naked women on my shirt. And I go, I know. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing about this story. Those naked women were on his shirt when he saw it on the rack and said, I choose you. The naked women were on his shirt when he tried the small on and then chose to go with the medium. As he, as he walked to the cash register and set it down and said to the person, I'm purchasing this today. Here's my visa. Thank you very much. There were naked women all over that shirt. And they were on the shirt when he put it on in the mirror fixed his eyebrows, and came out for the service to start. They were right there in front of him, hiding in plain sight. The truth is, in our lives, we don't see the full story. We see what we want to see. And because that's true, we mistake much of the reality uh, that, that, that we assume is there for what we want to be there oftentimes. Leadership guru Stephen Covey, in his incredible book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, put it this way, quote, we see the world not as it is, but as we are, or as we are conditioned to see it. The truth is, reality is made up mostly of what we cannot see. Because God and angels and demons and eternity and the true story, this is what we're unable to see because of our fallen state, the Bible says. So what we need to learn to do is see the spiritual, to see the unseen. What we can see now, what we can spend now, what we can taste now, what we can handle now, these things are all passing away. What we can see now will soon be gone, but what we cannot see will last forever. It's the unseen realm that is eternal. And so what we need to ask is, what are my blind spots that I am blind to? What am I missing? What are the, 
What are the squiggly lines forming that I'm not seeing because I'm not connecting the dots because I'm just seeing what I want to see here in this shirt? We all know that we are what we eat because everything we eat comes into us and then becomes a part of us. But the truth is we are also what we see and the way that we see it. David knew this, and that's why he said in Psalm 101, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. I think we all need to be careful to watch what we watch. What am I taking in? What movies am I watching? What am I bringing in through my eyes that, that, that I should be shunning? And as I say that, of course, I'm talking about the wicked things, like David said, to shun the vile things, to shun the wicked things. But it's not just the bad things that can get in our way. As we learned last week, uh, it's not just being bad that's a problem. It's also being busy that's a problem. So perhaps there's things that we're watching that aren't wicked. They're just worthless. They're just not helping us. They're just distractions from where we want to be. In Psalm 119, David also said, turn my eyes from worthless things and revive me again in your way. God wants us to not just avoid wicked things, but also to, to stay away from worthless things, things that are just holding us back. Because as uh, the old saying goes, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Or as Jesus put it, the eyes are the lamp of the body. And what that means is what you see will impact you. What you see and what you make sense of in the reality that, that you're living in, the story that you're writing, it will impact your life and the lives of those around you. Now here, as Jesus puts it, he's describing a person whose body is impacted. Essentially, he's saying his whole life is impacted because of his vision, his spiritual vision or the lack thereof. Now, there are two ways to bump into things in your room. There's two, if, as you're walking through your house, there's two ways to smack into something. And one way would be for there not, to not be enough light. If, and we've all done that, right? It's like, I need to get up and get some water in the night, but I don't want to turn the lights on because, you know, my eyes are all adjusted now. And so it's like, I, I know my house. Bang. <laughs> Coffee table. Bang. Leg of the bed. That's when we really test how much we love Jesus, right? There's, there's some words that might come out of our mouth sometimes that are not that spiritual, right? Bang. Because there wasn't enough light. But the second way would be for there to be enough light, but your eyes not to work properly. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's plenty of light. But if that light's in you is dark, if your eyes aren't working, it doesn't matter how much light there is. If the eyes aren't receiving that light and aren't using that light, it will still end up bad for your body as well. That is to say that if your eyesight is, spiritually speaking, an eyesore, an eyesore. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're spiritually an eyesore, that is to say you're living uh, darkly. You're living a, a dark life. You're living a, a vindictive life, a, a petty life, an anxious life, a worried life, a life that's full of mistrust, a mistrusting or, or greed or jealousy. Your, 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 your vision, how you see things is going to be changed. It's, it's, not, it's going to affect everything about your body. It's going to affect everything about your health. It's going to affect everything about your relationships. And so when we talk about being blind and seeing, of course, we think about that salvation moment, that Paul moment, you know, who hated Christians, hated Jesus, and he was blind. And then God, bam, touched him. And he, his scales fell, and he opened, I can see now. I see everything differently. And when we think about spiritual blindness, I think a lot of times we think about that. But what we're forgetting is that it's not always so clean cut as I was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind. Now I see. There's also the stages of seeing, the stages of growth. Don't mistake what I'm saying. There has to be a moment where you call Jesus Lord. There has to be a moment where you invite him into your heart. But I think there's also degrees of blindness. And I think our emphasis on that moment, when did you get saved? When did you give your life to Christ? When were you, amazing grace, blind, but now you can see, and a, a wretch, but you've been loved? Right? Like, that we, we can forget about the fact that even once we're saved, even once we're forgiven, this, there's still areas where we have blind spots. There's still areas where we're not seeing correctly. There's still things that are right there in front of us on the shirt. We're just missing them. And so God needs to touch the areas of our life that are spiritually an eyesore. But fortunately, whatever for you is holding back your life from the progress you're meant to have, whatever that is, Jesus came so that the unhealthy in vision would receive sight. 
And those who have already received some sight would receive more sight. And those who have received a lot of sight would even receive more sight. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for 50 years and growing in grace. There's more for you to see. There's more in store for you. You're not done. You're not finished. There's more of God's grace he wants to expose you to, more of his face he wants to expose you to, more of even what's inside of you that you're capable of, more people to touch, more he wants to trust to you, more he wants to do through you. God wants to bless you, increase you, cause his face to shine upon you. I'm just telling you something. As long as we're living in a fallen world where there's still going to be explosions, displacing hundreds of thousands of people and killing people, as long as there's going to be diseases that ravage the world, people who are giving into their anxiety, as long as there's going to be young girls who are not eating because they think if they can just lose some weight and be pretty like the girls they see on the TikTok for you page, that then they'll have worth, then they'll have meaning, then they have, then I'm telling you, there's going to be Christians that need to rise up to share share the love and share hope and be kind and give grace and make a difference in their high school this September, whether it's online or in person. I'm telling you that God wants you to see more. He wants you to see clearly. He wants you to be aware that you don't see right now as well as he wants you to see. There's areas for all of us where there's an unhealthy aspect to our eyesight, to our our vision. He wants us to tap into the fullness of sight that he came for us to have. And if you don't think this is what Jesus came for, I got news for you. It's right there in his mission statement, Luke 4, 18. The reason he came, this is Jesus' purpose for coming, anointed to bring the gospel to the poor, to heal broken hearts, to proclaim, pro proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And that vision is not just that one time event of salvation. It's that constant ongoing act by which our eyes are healed of areas where they are unhealthy. Now, fortunately for me, in giving a message on what it's like to have an unhealthy eye, I feel uniquely qualified <laughs> because of what happened in 2020. Yes, the irony of hurting your eye in year 2020 is not lost on me. But I ended up in the hospital on the 4th of July after a fire rocket shot straight into my eyeball. And it was, a, there am I being wheeled in to, uh, the, to get the MRI because they were telling me at that moment that uh, they were worried that the cornea had two scratches in it and that maybe the eye had somewhat been ruptured. And yes, it was not a pretty sight to, to look into those beautiful baby blues on that day. But, but it's been a journey. And uh, the way I see it, anything you go through, God wants to teach you something through. And he always wants to give us comfort that we might receive comfort. And if I'm just being completely honest with you, um, I needed to receive comfort. What you saw there being wheeled into um, that hospital back room was really a difficult test for me. And a number of times, I, I felt like I was going to hyperventilate. And not just because I was wearing a mask, but I always feel like I'm going to hyperventilate when I'm wearing a mask. Like, they're supposed to be soothing to breathe into a paper bag, but breathing into a mask does not soothe me in any way, shape, or form. But and I did get judged when I posted one of those photos on, on Instagram. Like one of the first comments was like, how dare you wear that mask improperly? It's not even covering your nose. I'm like, I'm sorry. The next time I almost blow my eyeball out, I will really be, I didn't even know I had a mask on or what my name was, by the way, in that moment. I, but I did walk into the hospital like with my hand like this. My wife was beside me. I bumped into the door frame because she thought I had it. And, and, uh, but she was a great nurse through the whole thing. And, and, and the, the lady's like, what's your name? I'm like, Lesko. She's like, you're my pastor. I was like, that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it was hard because that is the exact hospital emergency room where we were taken uh, back in 2012 when my daughter Lindy went to heaven. And I had not been in those ER rooms uh, since that night. And it brought back a lot of, of hard memories and challenging moments. And I was pretty sure as I got wheeled in, I was never going to see again out of that eye. And, and so it was just hard. And I just like it was like a lot of fear and a lot of impact. Let me tell you, when your eye is hurting, it impacts your whole body. I can tell you right now what Jesus said here is so true. If your eye is unhealthy, your whole body does not feel right. It impacts your whole life to not see like you're meant to. But the scary thing is the human eye is capable of adjusting. 
And so even right now, while I'm preaching this message, out of my left eye, things are still pretty blurry. And I'll talk more to you about that in just a moment. But I don't notice it most of the time because your brain adapts. God's made us pretty resilient. And so I have, even now, in this moment, kind of adapted to not seeing properly. And that's the danger, is that we might not notice areas of our life spiritually where we're settling for less than God has for us. You might even have heard this message and go, I don't even see a thing. It's like, maybe that's the problem. If you say you can see, Jesus says he can't do anything for you. But those who are willing to, this is John chapter 9, those who are willing to admit that they're blind, he has lots more in store for you. So I hope you're not saying, this message I don't need, but maybe there's someone in my life who needs it more. we got to always put the oxygen mask on us before we're able to put them on somebody else. And so I hope for all of us today, we're going, God, help me to see. Open my eyes up. There's areas where I know I'm blind. I don't even know what it is, but God, I want you to show it to me. And I don't want to be content just getting by, looking mostly out of my right eye. I really, if you can touch this eye, I want you to do it. I want you to, I want you to bring me total healing. I want total deliverance. I want everything that Christ has for me. What are my blessings? blind spots that I'm blind to? What is my car seat I am buckled into that is not buckled into that car? So help me. Here's five words I wrote down that I've been hearing my ophthalmologist toss around. These are just like hot kicks, all right? Here's the words I've been living in that God's been speaking spiritual revelation to me about. The first is pressure. Pressure. There is pressure inside your eyeball. And your eye should be normally, they say, between 10 and 20 as they do pressure checks. And I've had the pressure tested in my eye probably 100 times since the 4th of July. And uh, that was ever since I was in the ER that night, immediately doing pressure checks. Because the trauma, the impact of that mortar round that hit the eye, uh, it caused damage. And part of the damage, it caused bleeding. And that bleeding internally inside the eyeball caused there to be unhealthy amounts of pressure. Now, the highest I ever got was 50. And the pressure, when it reached 50, it made me physically ill. It made, like when your ears are off, you get that vertigo. But when the eyes mess up, it can do the same thing. I spent one uh, 24 hour period when the pressure was at its absolute highest in bed, in the dark, completely disoriented and confused and could barely get up, barely eat anything. It was just sick and I felt pale and sweaty. And it really messes with you. You have pressure. Well, here's the parallel we live in a world of pressure. We live in a world of stress. There's so much pressure we're being bombarded by. Pressure to perform, pressure to succeed, pressure in school, pressure in sports, pressure in family. We have pressure when we're posting things in, in life. And just in every way, we deal with pressure, the pressure of health things that can all of a sudden go sideways. We have and are going to deal with pressure. Here's my question for you. What do you do when you feel that pressure? Do you lash out at others, feeling entitled to be mean to someone because you're just having a bad day? Do you freak out? Do you worry and obsess over it and, and, and just completely just let it run and run, run and around and around and around and around, around in your mind until you're almost in a, a downward spiral? Do you medicate? Oh, I'm feeling that pressure. OK, well, I'm going to alleviate it with this spending or this drinking or this uh, mindless entertainment just to take my mind off it. It's, it can be easy. Or do you worship and thrive and evolve and grow and listen and do the things you need to to build your pressure up in here? Because like a submarine that would be crushed like a tin can by the pressure of the deep sea, the solution is to have a pressure on the inside equal or greater than the pressure on the outside. You and I can't do anything about the pressure that we face in this world. 2020 or not, there is pressure that we are going to experience. The solution isn't to try and get rid of external pressure, but to rather have a greater source of inward pressure, pressure that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus, when you read the Gospels, will always be found before the day begins in a secret place. Before the crazy trial began in a secret place. I was texting a friend who I've been reading through the Gospel of John with. And I said, isn't it interesting that before the cross, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray because pressure was coming. He needed to get alone and pray. But it says Judas knew to go there and betray him because Jesus often went there with his disciples. 
So the Garden of Gethsemane was a place Jesus frequented. Why? Because that was a location where he could pump up the pressure on the inside of his heart to deal with the constant pressure that he was up against. So don't try and get rid of pressure. Good luck with that. In this world, you will have, say it with me, pressure. Type it in the chat. Pressure. The solution is more pressure in here, air pressure from the Holy Spirit who will breathe his uh, power, his pneuma, wind power, <sighs> wind power into your heart. Pressure is not the problem. The lack of pressure in your heart is. Number two, I wrote this word down, trauma. Trauma, the actual trauma of the, the eye. Right now where I'm sitting, um, my, my, the blood's all out of the eye. The pressure is healthy. I'm down from five daily drops in that eye to one, thank God, because that took an Excel spreadsheet. And my wife doing nothing but chasing me down with the teal or the purple or the pink or the red or the, the turquoise drops. All right, or we left the house. Oh, we left the turquoise one behind. OK, because I'm going to get the turquoise eye drops and, and, and all that because the trauma. And now the, the visible evidence of it is, is all but gone. Uh, but there's still just the lingering impact from the trauma. Some of you today, being around you, none of us could, could tell what's, because the blood's gone. And the, the actual physical evidence of, of the difficulty may be no longer there. But there's still the impact of the, what's the word? Trauma. Hardship from your childhood, difficult things that you went through that no one would know. The fact that when you went to school, you didn't have lunch money or you didn't have clothes for, 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 for back to school. Oh, every, all your friends went back to school. You're like back to school shopping. Yeah, right. That was like back to school. What can I wear that still fits me even though I've grown like a weed, but my family doesn't have any money to, to wear these things. Making up stories about what you do on your family vacation. It's like, uh, worried about what I was going to eat because the school wasn't providing lunches for me. There's, there's trauma that can, can come from these things, these things that we face, these things that we endure, these things that we go through. And again, the question is, what do we allow that trauma to accomplish in us? Because it's going to have an after effect. You can't get hit by a train and not be different from the experience. And these, these things in life that feel like that, the grief, the, the sexual assault, the hard challenge of watching your mom pack up a vehicle and choose to not live with your family anymore. You've gone through hard things. That's, that's trauma. There, there is going to be an impact for the rest of your life and mine. The question is, what will that impact be? Will, will we become a bitter person? Will we be defined by the worst day of our life? Or will we allow God to heal the trauma and allow that scar that will remain, not festering and ugly and, and unhealthy, but a healed scar as a badge, as a settled symbol of something that God victoriously, with his mighty right arm, brought you through, that you are now eager and actively looking that you might find somebody going through a similar situation, that you might swoop in to give the comfort you receive. You see, that is also being impacted by your trauma, but in a positive way. A lot of us are trying to maybe make it live like or make it like the trauma didn't happen, which is what leads to so many problems. Masking a, a, a deep-seated thing will never help it heal. Pretending it's not there, ignoring it, hoping it will go away. It will not go away. It will manifest bubbling up to the surface in some other way that you end up becoming a, you know, addicted to gambling online when your family is asleep. Or so. It's going to find its way out. The question is, will you let it find its way out in a settled, joy-filled, helpful way that you're changed by what you went through? Who wouldn't be? But changed for the better, now positioned to watch God work in your life in massive ways. Some of you think that the problem and the reason you are the way you are is the hard things that you've gone through. I'm just going to let you know that's not true. It's never the thing you went through. It's always what you see in the thing that you went through, how you think about the thing that you went through. They tell me when this is all over, the shape of my eye might have changed. They're not looking at that yet because we're just getting through the trauma, getting, getting healthy. 
But they say that when it's all said and done, they might test the eye and find out my prescription has changed. And how useless would it be for me to still insist on wearing old contact lenses when I have a new prescription? Don't, don't pretend the trauma didn't happen. Just let God fit you for new lenses. And I'm, I'm hoping, by the way, that if my eye has changed, it's for the better and not for the worse. They're going to tell me when this is all done, like, it's freakish, Levi, but you got eagle eye vision, right? And I'm like, better than LASIK. Get shot with an eye. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Just like, all right, here we go. I got two of them. No, listen, let God lean into what God is trying to do in your eye through the hard thing that you faced. Because he always turns trash into triumph and turns the suffering we face into a story of his grace and what our good God, who is able to make all things turn around for the good, is working in your life. Trauma, pressure. Third word is focus. My big eye, my big problem, my big eye, my big eye, <laughs> that was when there was a lot of pressure, right? No, my, my big problem right now is focus. They're telling me my eye is not automatically focusing like it normally would. It's not, uh, if I look out of this eye, automatically pulling in the foreground. It's like kind of all kind of blurry, but then I have to try and focus it. And what the ophthalmologist explained to me, with incredible bedside manner, by the way, was just basically that it's stunned. The moment the impact happened, it just kind of got stunned and just kind of freaked out. It was like, oh, we're just going to chill here if it's cool. And it's, it's not kind of rebooted yet. And that when, when we deal with all the, the big problems and, and keep it healthy and deal with all the eventually, he says, it, it, it should start focusing again. Here's my question. What are you focusing on? What means the most to you in this life? And what's your go-to when you lose control, when, when things are out of your control? If you're like many, uh, you end up like Snoop Dogg with your mind and your money and your money and your mind. You're focusing on it. And you're like, that's a weird connection. Actually, no, it's not. The reason Jesus told this uh, parable of the lamp in Mark, Matthew chapter 6 is, in fact, because he was trying to teach on money. He said, in fact, the verse right before it, verse 20 and 21, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Then he immediately said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So what he was saying is, your body can't be healthy if you're staring at the wrong things. And the unhealthiest thing you could stare at would be just money. And that's where your treasure is. That's where your heart's at. Because your money is not a good God. Your money can't save you. Your, your money can, can, can buy nice things. But guess what? It can't help your marriage. It can't actually help your relationship with your son. It, it can't actually change anything about your heart. And, and then the, the sneakiest thing about money, and the reason he connects it to being blind and thinking you can see, but you can't, is because uh, money sins, unlike other sins, you can do without knowing you're doing them. That's creepy, which is why in Luke chapter 12, he says, watch out. Everyone say, watch out. Yeah. Watch out for greediness in your life. What, now, why would you say watch out for greediness? You would never say that about murder. Right? Watch out for murder. Like, no, like most sins, you know you're doing them while you're doing them. It's like, oh, you're not my wife, right? Like, no, you know you're committing adultery. You know you're stealing. You know you're telling a lie. But you can accidentally uh, fall into greediness. Why? Because it's, there's a deceitfulness to it. And your eyes will trick you. And you, you all of a sudden, you're making unhealthy decisions. You're focusing undue attention on this or that. You're looking for this to bring you true joy. You're looking for this to define you. You're deriving your identity from some earthly accomplishment or possession. And we all do this. We all think, if I had that, I'd be happy. If I had what she has, I'd be happy. If I could afford the things that they have. And what are those people that you're looking to as the standard of happiness thinking, if I had that, I'd be happy. There's always that bigger fish. And that's the deceitfulness of riches. They can make you think there's, there's something uh, that, that, that they can bring you that they actually can't. So what you spend your money on reveals values. What you spend your money on actually gives a map of your heart. Someone said, if, if you want to find out what's really the most important thing to you, where your true riches are, uh, ask the question, what do you have the easiest time spending money on? What is like not hard at all? Like it's like the money basically is like grows wings and just shoots out of your, out of your wallet. That shows your passion. That shows what you truly 
care about. And it's not to say that you shouldn't care about travel or shouldn't care about buying a, a boat or buying a, a vacation cabin or whatever else you might have as your financial goal. I need a new snowmobile. But it is to say that if when it comes to the kingdom of God and heaven and being uh, the hands and feet of Jesus and seeing his church built and seeing hungry people fed, if, if you aren't just full of joy at giving resource, if the idea of giving your tithe, of offerings above and beyond that to extend the reach of the kingdom, if, if that to you is like pulling teeth and pain filled, then how can you say that your heart is truly anchored in heaven? How can you truly say that God and his kingdom matters more than everything else to you? So it's a test of what you truly value. So as you take that test, and again, we're in a year of testing, 40 days of, of testing in 2020, 20 plus 20 is 40. 40 is the year of testing. As we test ourselves, we locate our true God, and we can relocate assets to actually cause our heart to be shifted into the things that we want to be most important to us. Focus, trauma, pressure, fourth word, dilation. If I could get close enough to the camera, you would see that my left pupil is still pretty dilated. Dilation is all about how much light is coming in or how little light is coming in. If we're trying to see the stars. We stay dark as long as we can. Snipers actually save their night vision. They keep a patch on or whatever. to keep. Oh, no, this has adjusted. I'm not letting any light in, right? How much light is coming in, too much or too little? They're both a mistake, right, at the wrong times. If I want to see the stars, I need my pupils to get really dilated. If I'm in a bright environment, it would be really nice, left eye, if in these lights, these, these lights I'm under, if you would just come down a little bit. But no, it's like, I've got to be dilated all the time. Spiritually speaking, there's a parallel. God wants to open the eyes of our heart to let more light in. We don't need more light. We, the lights come. Jesus is the light of the world. He is right there with you in your home, right there with you in your apartment, right there with you in your car. You need to open up your eyes to see what he sees, to see what he's doing, to remember that he's right there with you, to remember that he is always for you, to remember that he loves the people that you're annoyed by. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prayed that the Father of glory, the Lord of Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. Here we, here we have it. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. And it goes on from there. The question is, are you letting God dilate the pupils of your soul by spending time in his word, by spending time with his people, by spending time uh, in, in church where you're able to listen to God's word together with other people, getting a watch party together? Are you doing the things that will dilate the pupils of your soul and let you see that there's more than just this world? The last word is brilliance. Brilliance. You saw in that picture, <laughs> my left eye, the white of it was not white. There was nothing brilliant about it. My eye was cloudy and and, and my vision was milky, and my eye was just not brilliant. I've always been told I have really pretty eyes. But no one was com complimenting my left eye. Even Jenny was like, oh, yes, you're still pretty to me. <laughs> Brilliance. Intensely bright or vivid. My kids were the best, though, because they were like, yeah, we can hardly notice. <laughs> like trying to be natural. Lennox, Lennox goes, though, Dad, you look like Nick Fury. But he said Mick Fury. You look like Nick Fury. The guy with the, the cat that scratched his eyeball out. Thanks, son. <laughs> Psalm 13, verse 3. We're winding the plane down here. David said, turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes, or I will die. Church, God doesn't just want to bring sight to your eyes. He wants to bring the sparkle sparkle back to your eyes. He doesn't want your eyes to be dull, gla glossed over. He doesn't want your eyes to be flat and faded and chronically tired, given over to stress and to worry. He wants your eyes shining with hope and shining with purpose and resolve, whimsical, full of wonder, full of passion almost mischievous, like a twinkle in your eyes. He wants you to wake up with that excitement. What's going to happen today? What does God have planned for, for, for life today? He wants life to be that adventure where there's a, a sparkle. When did you lose the sparkle in your eye? 
And do you realize that your King Jesus wants to restore to you the joy of your salvation? So how do you get the sparkle back? You're like, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> just, just curious. Because it, it would sound really great to not be jaded and skeptical and, and cynical. To not always assume the worst is going to happen. And just expect for things to go wrong because you're living this victim story. The answer, I believe, comes from embracing fully the extravagant love of God for you and remembering the fact that he doesn't just love you. He also likes you. And he rejoiced the day that you gave your heart to him. He's going to rejoice for some of you that in just a minute, you're going to open your heart up to him. He's rejoicing even for some of you. You opened your heart up to the grace of God even while this worship experience was already happening and you didn't want to. You just got saved, and you're not even happy about it right now. You're almost furious. You're like, I do believe, but I hate that I do. And the world has nothing to offer me that kind of joy. There's not a politician. There's not a job. No one can offer you that true, lasting sparkle in your eye, not just for an evening, but for a lifetime on into eternity. There's not a drug. There's not a paycheck. There's not a European vacation. There's not a luxury yacht that can offer you the sparkle in your eye, not just a year, not just a month. I'm talking about for a lifetime. Even when you're old, even when you're sick, even when you're dying, there can still be that sparkle in your eye that comes from love from your creator to you. You're like, why would he want to do that for me? You're looking at your life like, even as a Christian, I don't think my life, my, my, my life for God is that great. Levi, I, I feel like I'm a, a spiritual eyesore. Well, don't forget that he still looks at you. And every time he sees you, it's like the first time he saw you and says, you are a sight for my sore eyes. I love seeing you. There's not a thing my children could do that would ever make me stop embracing them and loving them. They are every morning that I see them a sight for sore eyes. I can't wait for them to wake up most, most mornings. When I see them, though, I'm always excited to see them. And your father feels that way about you. And when you stop resisting that kind of love and, and stop trying to earn his love and instead just let him smother you with kisses and let him wrap his arms around you and let him say to you, you are a sight for sore eyes you will begin to watch that love transform you from the inside out. So church, set your sights on pleasing him. Set your eyes on him as you run this race. And you will realize there, there is incredible power that comes flowing into your heart as it's set on him. His eyes are actually scanning to and fro, looking for opportunities to bless any of his kids who are putting their eyes on him. And Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for what you're doing. I feel your Holy Spirit even right now just moving so powerfully. If you're leaning into this right now, would you just raise a hand up saying, I'm a spiritual eyesore, but, but I receive the extravagant love of Jesus for me. Raise your hand up. You're just saying, I need it anew. I need it brand new today. I've been walking with Jesus for a year, 10 years, or 50, but I need that love again right now to change me. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. I want to pray for you, but I want you to raise that hand up. Father, bless these. They don't have to change a thing for you to love them. But I thank you that as they are changed by your love, they're going to begin to see what the car seat is in their life that's not buckled up. They're going to see the, the, the print on the shirt they didn't notice before. And I thank you for it. So would you dilate the pupils of their soul, Jesus? Would you bring healing to sick bodies? Would you bring your peace to anxious minds? You can put your hands down. If you're watching right now and you've never yet said yes to Jesus, today's the day and now's the time. He died on the cross for you, rose from the dead on your behalf, and stands right now at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God, willing and able to save you should you so much as give him an indication that you're ready for it. If you are, if that's you I'm describing, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say it out loud. Say it. Mean it in your heart. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I can't fix myself, but I believe you can. Please come into my heart. Make me new. Help me to see. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.